years ago, Forbidden Planet lent meaning to the two biggest post-war innovations in American life, the interstate highway and the television. This latter invention is now an appurtenance in 44% of American homes, up from less than 5% immediately after the war. But for the crew of the C-47D, this being the code name for the United Planets' flying disc, television is much more than a way to unwind with Dobie Gillis after a hard day's work. It's instead an invaluable tool to orient oneself in a stellar void that's otherwise woefully short on points of reference. While aloft, the crew of the C-47D gets all their visual information about their universe not through any kind of window or porthole. The saucer they're in has no front or back. Instead, they use a viewplate, that is a televisual screen that provides them with a privileged view of their destination and in the movie's introductory moments even allows them to gaze on a stellar eclipse without damaging their eyes. The viewplate thus gives the crew a sense of grounding, but less by orienting them than by providing a surrogate for orientation. If the C-47D's perfect symmetry to prevents the crew from knowing if they're going forward or backward, at least they typically know when they are traveling toward the subject of the viewplate, as when they approach Altair 4 in the movie's introduction, or traveling away, as at the movie's climax when they flee the planet to avoid the shockwaves of its self-destruction. And for the denizens of the many Levittowns and their imitators, the homogeneous suburbs that had come to honeycomb the smoothed-out space between American cities, would they not feel a cousin of the C-47D crew's rudderlessness? And were they not already looking, in greater and greater numbers, to the viewplates in their living rooms to provide a sense of grounding, something toward which to move in an environment otherwise so uniform and unchanging that to travel about within it felt like not traveling at all? Implicit in the popular 1950s slogan, Adams for Peace, is an unspoken regret that they had ever been used for war. Begun by Harry Truman and fully embarked on under the current president, the Adams for Peace program researched the efficacy of harnessing atomic energy for a variety of silver civilian purposes, from generating electricity to devising new treatments for various medical conditions. The hope that the sword of atomic power could be beaten into the plowshare of perpetual motion showed remarkable persistence, even after the first Russian atom bomb test in 1949 shifted the arms race into full gear and threatened to launch an orgiastic production of atomic weapons. Atomic power's most captivating prom promise is the possibility that it might provide the virtually limitless thrust needed to bridge the distances between the stars. This idea has been the stuff of pulp fiction sci-fi magazines and dime store novels since at least the 1930s, but the devising of the atom bomb, however detrimental an impact it seems to have had on the likelihood of human survival, has nevertheless made such exciting possibilities seem more like Im imminent prospects than distant hypotheticals. Thus, many of today's science fiction movies speculate broadly about ways in which the energy of the split atom could be harnessed to enable interstellar travel. But in keeping with the spirit as well as the letter of the Atoms for Peace program, these movies also give the ostensibly peaceful enterprise of space exploration a decidedly militaristic mean. Hollywood could model its celluloid astronauts after, say, legendary aviators Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart. But instead, they typically look and act more like bomber crews. The interiors of their ships resemble not ocean liners, commercial jets, mobile laboratories, or any one of a host of other possibilities, but almost invariably the interiors of B-29s or Navy submarines, complete with radar screens, gyroscopes, and Norden bomb sites. Even as the Department of War became the Department of Defense in 1949, the effort to redirect civilized progress from war toward peace seemed to have the effect not of excising militarism from civilian life, but instead of allowing the military to permeate all other arenas of existence. Over time, the Red Scare movie of the Invasion USA variety has morphed into the science fiction alien invasion movie a genre whose profits soon practically rival the money to be had in making military hardware. 
Like the Red Scare flick, the alien invasion film spans the spectrum of respectability from classic pictures like 1951's The Day the Earth Stood Still and 1953's The War of the Worlds to quaint low-budget fare. But this very similarity between the anti-commie movie and the alien invasion picture points to a problem with the conventional wisdom regarding today's science fiction, that it's a submerged expression of a collective fear in the West of communist infiltration, a fear that presumably can't be stated outright and so finds all manner of oblique expression. The idea that a KGB squad might be secretly at work in Sand Rock, Arizona is too shocking to consciously entertain, apparently. And so we have instead the one-eyed, body-snatching moss creatures of It Came From Outer Space, who embody communist ideology by renouncing individualism in favor of the hive mind, and communist expansionism in their imperative to appropriate Earth in favor of their home planet, which is in these movies invariably becoming inhab uninhabitable due to some environmental disaster or another. The rise of suburban sprawl after the war is, among other things, a result of this fear over the bomb, as more and more families try to relocate away from urban centers that will be likely targets of atomic attack. Aesthetically and architecturally speaking, Levittown is a nightmare, yes, made up of largely identical single-story homes arranged in rigid rows along curving wide streets. But at least it gives fretful silly city dwellers a place to hide from the looming likelihood of nuclear conflagration. Like so many other threads of the social fabric, Levittown finds its origin in the olive drab culture of the war years. William Levitt, in fact, first designed the low-cost prefabricated homes that populated Levittown during the war when he delivered 2,000 such units for the U.S. Navy. But Levitt certainly didn't invent the modern suburb, nor is he responsible for the insularity of the housing communities that have sprung up all around the nation since the war. Another antecedent of the modern suburb can be found in the temporary workers' communities that sprung up in the environs of Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Oak Ridge, Tennessee, as part of the Manhattan Project. Secrecy being paramount, the military put a premium on compartmentalization when designing these f factory communities. Not only did checkpoints isolate these houses from the outside world, often fences also separated each individual home from those around it. Although neighbors weren't prevented from speaking, they were nevertheless discouraged from for forging too tight a bond with their community. The project, after all, required that each individual worker focus on his or her specific task without devoting too much thought to the overall effort. Too many workers comparing notes might jeopardize the project. This atomization of the family into indivisible units has persisted since the war, even though the reason for it is now obscure. In Oak Ridge, at least, the fences dividing the houses stayed up after peace broke out, its residents having grown accustomed to their insular lifestyle and presumably finding comfort in the privacy and sense of safety provided by the trappings of military secrecy. The popular press spun the compartmentalization of the Manhattan Project laborers into an early peon to the virtues of diversity, since the project required gathering together all manner of professionals, from professors, including no Nobel Prize winners, to careful New England craftsmen and burly Southern Negroes, all the races and types of the U.S., who left their civilian lives to relocate in dusty deserts in the service of their country. But this compartmentalization also had the tangential effect of generating a sense of learned helplessness in those participants in the Manhattan Project who reacted with horror when they learned the fruits of their labors. Short of outright treason, as in the case of Julius Rosenberg, the civilian Signal Corps worker said to have given the secret of the atom bomb to the Russians, workers disgusted at their unwitting participation in what they saw to be a doomsday scheme had little recourse once the deed was done. The contemporaneous liberal commentator Dwight MacDonald underscored the detrimental effect the military's need-to-know policies had on individual agency when he praised the few scientists who had declined to work on the bomb. This is resistance. This is negativism, he affirmed, and in it lies our best hope. Incorrigibly pessimistic about humanity's prospects for coexisting with its dreadful new invention, 
McDonald inadvertently highlighted the futility of individual resistance against a bureaucracy on the scale of the Manhattan Project. All one can do in the face of such a mammoth destructive undertaking is vote with one's feet. And this, of course, is only an option for the privileged few who are apprised of the project's true, true goals. The rest of the Manhattan Project workers never knew enough to make an informed decision on the matter, having had their free will compartmentalized into irrelevance. The title most often evoked to bolster the argument that Hollywood sci-fi is secretly about communist infiltration is probably last year's Invasion of the Body Snatchers, in which aliens more flora than fauna assume the meaty bodies of God-fearing townsfolk to subvert all of America's wholesome institutions from within. Although Jack Arnold's film is probably the most discussed entry in the body snatcher genre, it's far from alone. Aliens are conquering the bodies of the unwitting in Matinee Bijou just about every day of the week. In the aforementioned uh, forthrightly xenophobic It Came From Outer Space, as well as The Crawling Eye, 1958, episode 101, Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, and Roger Corman's It Conquered the World, 1956, episode 311. Predictably, the marauding aliens in many of these movies often take a special interest in towns adjoining military bases, so that the communities these movies are set in end up looking like direct post-war inheritors of Los Alamos and Oak Ridge. Their military families isolated in similar homes cut from either the Old Town Americana or the Levittown Mold. Making of those it chooses slaves. Of this woman, a willing handmaiden. Of the chief of police, a cold-blooded killer. Well, I've known you for five years. You just killed a man in cold blood. Why? I'll have to place you under protective custody. On the surface, this would seem to support the case that these movies stand in for anti-communist anxiety. The aliens presumably taking over the minds of military and scientific men and women to glean classified inf intelligence, much as the Soviets used the Rosenbergs to unlock the secret of the atom bomb. But in these movies, the aliens' technical know-how is usually so superior to that of the primitive Earthlings that they have no use for such information. They have some other purpose in mind. In the bellicose invaders from Mars, they hope to sabotage an orbital missile defense system before construction on it can be finished. In The Space Children, episode 906, they ultimately prove to be benevolent, and when they destroy the semi-secret weapon being worked on at the local army base, the Thunder Intercontinental Missile, is to punctuate their day the Earth stood still style warning to the human race about the folly of nuclear weapons. Furthermore, if these movies usually undermine the presumptive alignment between alien and communist in their twist endings, which typically reveal the aliens' true mo nature and motives, they also offer far more nuanced and problematic protagonists than would be the case if they took the trope of the all-American hero versus the godless communist as their sole guiding ethos. In contrast with the unambiguous celluloid champions of yore, Hypermasculine figures like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon with their unwavering moral compasses, indefatigable for physical prowess, and uniquely privileged access to strategic and tactical information. The ter terrestrial would-be leading men of post-war sci-fi are frequently plagued with petty obstacles and doubts. Looked at in the light of the Manhattan Project, these obstacles are likely to sound familiar. Excessive secrecy, for instance. In Invaders from Mars, when the family patriarch dons his robe to investigate his son's claim that a flying saucer has landed in the backyard, he tells his wife that he's obliged to investigate any anomalous reports, no matter how seemingly preposterous, because of the sensitive nature of the work at the nearby plant. He even politely rebuffs her when she starts asking too many questions about it. Now, Mary, you know I can't tell you about that, he says before strolling outside, where the aliens promptly swallow him up into a hole in the ground making him a victim of his own reticence. Dave Brewster, the father and husband in Space Children, is similarly vexed. He and his family are relocating to a trailer park on a California beach after his employer, the Oakland Electronic Company, picks up a contract to work on an experimental ballistic missile for the military. When Ann peppers Dave with questions about the prospective test launch of the Thunderer missile, he peppers his answers with speculative maybes and I don't knows. Anne wonders aloud why Dave doesn't have a firmer grip of the grasp of the big picture, 
but you, your company, you worked on the Thunderer for months. And he clarifies that he merely worked on one part out of 35,000. Dave and Anne subsequently spend much of the movie's first half having animated discussions with the Brewster family's various neighbors about the Thunderer and its role in America's Bruja with the Soviets. These conversations have the broad feel of political exchanges among laypersons rather than the focused discourse of professionals, because even though the trailer park's residents are all actively engaged in the Cold War effort, their roles are no so selective that they know no more about government policy in general than the random person on the street. Over a hot dog picnic, we learn that both Dave and Anne harbor serious doubts about the arms race, this circular, seemingly endless, endless effort to find something bigger and better to blow ourselves off the planet. But earlier, when Anne expresses misgivings about bringing the children to live at an installation engaged in work neither of them believes in, Dave retorts, Would you have wanted me to say no when the company insisted I come here? In a life tightly circumscribed by systems and bureaucracies, their options are constricted to two, the mute acquiescence condemned in mass-produced suburbs or the mute refusal so praised by Dwight MacDonald. And as it is, they find themselves cornered into a situation where they must act in a manner at odds with their convictions. Among she creatures' peculiarities is that it portrays captivity as bordering on hallucinogenic. Dr. Lombardi holds Andrea in thrall, using not physical cages, but mental and emotional methods of coercion that leave her dissociated, someone largely other than herself, but at the same time privileged with mystical insight. In this, she creatures hardly alone. The mind-altering jailers, a not uncommon theme in contemporary science fiction and genre movies, such as the 1955 Mickey Spillane adaptation Kiss Me Deadly, in which hoods ply Philip Marlowe for his secrets by giving him sodium pentothal. Something similar transpires in possibly the most psychedelic sci-fi movie of the decade, Angry Red Planet, when astronauts run afoul of native creatures on the surface of Mars and provoke an invisible force into disabling their rocket. Mars is so ill-suited this human life that to move about is to wander in a hallucinatory days, which the movie conveys through cinemagic, a posterized photonegative process that gives the movie's Martian sequences the feel of hand-drawn animation. Of the two survivors who eventually manage to return to Earth, one is delirious from an alien disease and the other has suffered such trauma that she's amnesic. Hoping to discover what happened, scientists administered narcosynthesis, sodium pentothal again, to help her recover her memories. The truth serum prompts her to recall that the suffering of the astronauts at the hands of the Martians was intended as a warning to refrain from in any further such missions. The angry planet's natives want nothing of terrestrial primitivism. For centuries we have watched you, listened to your radio signals, and learned your speech and your culture. And now you have invaded our home. Technological adults, but spiritual and emotional infants. In the half dozen years since Invaders from Mars, kids around the world have gone on meaningfully peering through backyard telescopes. In Prince of Space, episode 816, they look out for the invasion and fire teams, suggesting they've been through this rigmarole before. David, will recall, was looking through this telescope in solitude and so had no one to corroborate his story. It turns out they needn't have bothered. In a textbook validation of the classic saw that you only find what you're looking for once you've given up looking, they abandoned the backyard telescope and retired to the living room and right away spy an invading alien craft on the family television. At first, the children don't believe their eyes. One stands in alarm, only to have his concerns dismissed by his friend. Supposed to be. That's a commercial. It couldn't be. You're not selling anything. You want a better commercial? They're probably selling some new toy. It's like a real rocket ship. Never mind that it actually does look like a toy. The warship is piloted by the malevolent ambassador phantom of the planet Crankor, and the Crankorians have hijacked the Earth's television signals to warn us, inexplicably, of their impending invasion. This theme of framing television as a high-tech weapon unfolds briskly in the film's next few minutes, 
Crankor appears on screen in science fictional garb with prominent TV antennas protruding from its helmet. We cut to a TV television studio where two frantic technicians stammer aloud as they try to figure out what's happening. TV's turning on us. The Marshall's plan still sets the terms of the cultural interchange between Japan and the United States, which might explain why the Toei Film Company borrows so directly from its occupiers at 20th Century Fox. Guns and butter platitudes aside, though, the war and occupation have ricocheted through the Japanese psyche. It's easy to see this in the litheness with which television is transformed from a source of diffident ecstasy. Consider the Price is Right's blissed-out contestants to one of simple menace. This is what happens when a technology is wrested from an ally, here the Germans, only for an adversary to later proffer it. But consider, too, the Japanese TV viewer's wobbly alignment with the Price is Right contestant and the American daytime TV target demo in turn. The kids are forgetting the difference between commercials and real life, but they know they're getting sold a bill of goods. Tushko Sadko, what we call signals of preoccupation in the post-war Soviet Union with the U.S. military's Pacific East Asian military offensive. A U.S. ally become Cold War adversary, Russia has reason to contemplate the American war machine, but an excuse to do so at some degree of remove. As the offensive's direct target, it goes without saying, Japan must engage with it much more directly and earnestly. Thus, for Tushko, the Pacific is a place for daring military exploits, deep-sea visions, a song and dance, whereas the Japanese, unsurprisingly, take such themes gravely. In acting as it does, a battle being waged on the Japanese mainland, Prince of Space is, among other things, an oblique imagining of Operation Downfall. Consider the frame of mind the American war planners must have been in to assign such a gloomy code name to the campaign to conquer the Japanese island. Now amplify this gloom tenfold and you may approximate the mood from which Gojira has risen. Released five years before, this bleak monster movie hybridizes the atomic bomb and the conventional Pacific campaign into a gray, impenetrable behemoth that ravages Tokyo and yields to no manner of resistance. One way of understanding Prince of Space's pervasive goofiness is as an answer to Gojira, which has a nightmarish quality unmatched by any of its Hollywood competitors. Its real-world war footage comes across as grisly in a genre thought of as merely spooky and fun. The predicament that entangles its heroes is a terminal one, the outcome, until the very end, hopeless. Absent their superhuman champion, Prince of Space's hapless citizens face a similarly lightless future. How are we to understand this? If we retrieve the tools Claude Levi-Strauss so recently gifted us, the reversible binary is said to operate in diverse and even unconnected cultures. Japan has had to confront the full surrender of family and ancestry to the individual, and more pointedly to the individual on the verge of extinction. Rather than being vouchsafed by her imperial god, her own flesh has lost its divinity and been given back to earth. <laughs>